Uh, good morning, everyone. And first, let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Ali Golipur. Dr. Golipur is an associate professor in radiology at Harvard Medical School and director of the Intelligent Medical Imaging Research Group at the Computational Radiology Laboratory and director of translational research in the radiology department in Boston Children's Hospital. He received his PhD in engineer electrical engineering at the University of Texas, and his research has focused on machine learning in medical imaging. He has developed many new techniques and tools for brain functional localization, motion and distortion correction in MRI, image registration and segmentation, atlas construction, and group analysis. Today, Dr. Goldipper will be talking about advanced fetal neuroimaging tools and resources. As several researchers in our center also study fetal MRI, I'm happy to have him as a speaker today and very looking forward to hearing his presentation. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining. Um, this is the outline. Uh, in the introduction, I briefly talk about early brain development and how we can analyze it. Then I will talk about techniques, in particular, the techniques about motion robust super resolution, MRI construction, and diffusion weighted MRI. I will also talk about atlas construction and segmentation and registration pipelines for fetal MRI processing. Then uh, I will spend some time on some on the impact of the work, which includes some of the applications, both in terms of the in vivo analysis of normal and abnormal. Uh, brain development before birth. An embryo is developing brain generous neurons at a very high rate um, that translates to approximately 100 billion neurons um, after pruning and then about 100 trillion estimated number of neural connections or synapses that form the brain. The early stages of brain development uh, are characterized by very complex process of um, neural, neuronal proliferation, migration, uh, pruning, synaptogenesis, and myelination that takes time. Um, but as you see from this diagram, a lot is happening just before birth, and then the brain continues to myelinate and mature, and the function and the structure shape uh, by adolescence. Functions such as visual and auditory develop, start developing before birth. Um, the peak might be um, uh, soon after birth and some other functions develop later. And a few things can go wrong while the brain is developing. We can have preterm birth depending on when the baby is born that may have an impact on how the brain is developing. Intrauterine growth restriction, congenital anomalies, whether they have genetics uh, sources or they're based on uh, isolated defects um, play a role here. And we have the effect of environmental causes or um, such as neurotoxins, such as alcohol or uh, drugs on brain development. And there has been research that indicates that there are some of the uh, developmental disorders that we see um, have roots in early development. And I've listed some of those here. These are the medical tests um, that we do in order to evaluate the brain structure and function. So we have neonatal brain assessment, uh, beha neonatal behavioral assessment. We have baby three that are done after birth. Neurobehavioral tests can be done after birth. Uh, also, we can do physical examination, we can do, uh, we can do blood tests, uh, specimens, and a lot of other things. The good thing about medical imaging is it, it can be done uh, early on before birth and then also after birth. And techniques that are safe and non-invasive, such as ultrasound and MRI, are particularly important here. These are some of the images that we can acquire of the fetus before birth. And so because of these advances in imaging, prenatal medicine has improved a lot. Basically, medical imaging is our window to look at uh, fetal development. And a science like fetal neurology 
And I can say that it did not exist a few decades ago just because of the lack of access to the, uh, to the fetus. Um, and we sometimes see um, statements like this in um, very well accepted textbooks um, in mid uh, 20th century. But fetal imaging has evolved a lot. In 1940, that shows that picture shows the first ultrasound of a fetus. And then in 1984, roughly 40 years later, we see the first 3D ultrasound of the fetus uh, that was taken by Dr. Baba, uh, who was both an MD and an electrical engineer. Uh, then in 1996, we have real-time 3D ultrasound. And uh, around the same time, uh, around the 1980s, we have MRI in the fetus. Now, um, in these years, we see 3D and 4D really nice pictures of fetuses. What does MRI add? So MRI provides much better soft tissue contrast, but not, not only that is useful for clinical evaluation, but also MRI, MRI provides a wide range of contrast that cannot be achieved by any other imaging modality. And diffusion weighted imaging and both contrasts are some of those. These are examples of what uh, some of MRI applications. Uh, and as a non-invasive technique, uh, this is a lot of potential and um, these types of images cannot be achieved by any other imaging modality. The downside about MRI is that it is slow by design and is susceptible to motion. So if the baby moves, uh, the images are just disrupted. So what is the practice? The practice, if I know a lot of you are imaging newborns and you know that in research settings, we cannot use sedation or anesthesia. So they, uh, we go for feed and app or similar strategies, which are time consuming, but they work to some extent. If you look at the, how we want to uh, image babies across these periods, we see that um, um, we, we, use, we can use feed and lab early on in gestation for preterm babies and after, right after birth. Um, for uh, children that are a little older, we can use the try without and see what happens. In some age range, it's very difficult to image babies. And in prenatal or fetal uh, imaging, basically we don't have any control on motion. So that's very challenging. There has been a lot of effort in developing motion robust techniques and a lot has been achieved. We have motion robust sequences and using sensors or cameras now being used in practice. But de depending on the population, major challenges and technical issues remain. For example, if you're imaging fetuses, they consistently move and you cannot attach sensors or you cannot use monitors, cameras to, to evaluate motion or use it in order to improve your analysis. So how can we move fetuses? The idea is similar to digital imaging. If we use a very fast shutter speed or if we image them very fast at a single shot, then even the subject is moving, we can acquire one good image. There are differences. Of course, this analogy that I made is not um, correct. Um, first of all, data in MRI is acquired in a case space, so it's all Fourier domain data. It's much different from digital imaging, but uh, I will use that analogy later on uh, during the technical part of the talk. These are examples of how the single, single shot fast spin echo scans have been the mainstream uh, sequence for fetal imaging. And they work to a good extent. And um, since the fetus is in the amniotic fluid, the motion is not as fast as uh, you would imagine. And at least for portions of the imaging, you get uh, relatively good quality images. Now, the way it is done is that you acquire slices one after each other, but because this takes time, about one minute, then you have distorted views in the other planes. So motion, fetal motion, basically, usually does not affect the slice plane view, but it affects the other planes. 
you basically get 2D images for evaluation. So no 3D met, uh, image is acquired routinely for evaluation. Now that, that is the, with that introduction, I will uh, introduce the first part of my techniques that is motion robust super resolution MRI. The question is, can we reconstruct fetal images in 3D? In other words, we have uh, slices acquired in different planes and these different angles, depending on how the fetus moved. And they don't need to necessarily be in orthogonal positions. They can be in any orientation. And those are the inputs to our program or algorithm. Can we reconstruct an image? And there have been a few talks. The idea is to estimate the relevant position of the fetus corresponding to each slice acquisition, and then correct the position once you have that estimation and combine the slices in 3D to reconstruct that image. Let's focus on the first one. How can we estimate the relative relevant position of the fetus? So we can assume that we have, um, there is an underlying anatomy for that fetus. And then for every slice, we can try to solve the problem that, okay, which, what was the transformation between this slice that, that uh, represents the motion of the fetus with respect to that uh, target anatomy. And because we assume that the fetal head is rigid, we assume that it has six degrees of freedom. Now, still that's an imposed problem because this slice is just, it, it has a thickness, that's true, it, it's in 3D, but um, solving that registration problem in order to find the relative position of this with respect to that anatomy is difficult because as you see in registration, you want to optimize the similarity metric and based on the gradients of how you change your transformation parameters change. To make things wor worse, we don't know that, tar that target reference volume. So what can we do? We, uh, first of all, for all practical purposes, as I said, because uh, finding the gradients of a slice while you're uh, changing its transformation is not feasible. We do the reverse. We register the volume to the slice, given that volume that we don't know. So it's actually called the slice to volume registration, but we do volume to slice registration and then inverse the mapping. What can we do? So we try to come up with an estimated volume that can be an average of some volumes, can be very blurry because of motion. We try to register each slice to those. In other words, that volume to slices, compute transformations per slice, and then refine our volume and then repeat the process. Once you correct for motion, you will end up with having data that is scattered in space. And so the first thing that came to mind was to solve it through scattered data interpolation, basically see how many points you have in the space and then put a kernel on it and solve the problem. However, is scattered data interpolation suitable for reconstruction? It's not because slices, especially the slices in MRI, uh, have a slice profile. They're thicker in the slice select direction compared to the infinite resolution. Uh, as I said, they had a slice profile. So considering them as dimensionless points um, is, makes a lot of wrong assumptions and induces errors into that reconstruction if you do it by slice to volume registration. That was the idea behind our work in 2010, which was published in Nature Transactions on Medical Imaging. Uh, we propose that instead of doing a scattered data interpolation through that process, you should, we should model how every slice is acquired of the target anatomy, of the fetal anatomy. And so the fetus goes through motion, a slice is selected through the slice, slice excitation pulse, then the MRI is signally acquired, it's quantized and sampled, and finally gives us a slice. If we can model that forward model, of the slice acquisition uh, mathematically with a model like this. And if we incorporate the slice se selection profile into it, which applies after the fetus moves, this is the image of the fetus and this simulates the motion or estimates the motion, then we can simply 
formulated as a maximum likelihood estimation and solve an inverse problem to uh, minimize the error between acquired slices and the slices that we estimate. We can solve that with, um, with, the, with assuming a Gaussian noise in that process, we can solve it with the electron noise. So that was that that made the framework. We have a forward model and a backward solution. And in order to take care of the uh, limited number of samples, in case it's an ill post problem, we can have a regularization factor there. Yet there is another issue. As I said, most of the haste slices or single shot slices are not affected by motion, but occasionally the fetus moves so fast that some of those are affected by motion. So what we added in that work, uh, in the same work, was to take into account these bad slices because over the course of a, a fetal session, many of the slices and some of these scans were affected like this, especially for fetuses at younger gestational ages. And if they were not detected and filtered through that process, they would have had a, a very adverse effect on the final reconstruction. On top of that, there is no guarantee for registration, even since we had the uh, most reliable hierarchical slice to volume registration approach, but it failed in some points. And those failures could lead to um, errors that would manifest this type of artifacts in the reconstructed images. So for, to sort all of those at once, we said, okay, we can use in a principled way, we can use robust estimation. So instead of L2 norm, we can use um, influence functions and norms that, that are robust. This is called M estimation instead of maximum likelihood estimation. And these are some of the uh, robust uh, function, influence functions that you can use. This is, if you will, this is uh, the L2 norm. This is the squares function that we mentioned in the maximum likelihood solution. One could think about L1, L2 in order to um, make it more robust. And this is Huber's function. And one could use two keys, pi square functions or redescending or any other redescending influence function to completely reject any outliers that are the source of interslice motion or registration failures. So this is the overview of our algorithm. We start with motion corrupted stack of slices and they are the emotion is estimated between them then they are they go through our super resolution robust volume reconstruction robust estimation is crucial here to take care of those artifacts that i mentioned and then after one iteration you get a little bit better reference volume your initial might be like this but over a period of uh, let's say three or four iterations you go from an image like this to a final image that is reconstructed like that. This is example how it is done. And this is another example. Original slices, if you just average them because of motion, they're blurry, and then you get something like that. So the community apparently liked that approach and built up on it uh, more um, other robust reconstruction frameworks. I'm citing here a paper by Maria, which was published two years after our paper. And she showed that uh, incorporating slice, a very accurate slice profile, how much of an impact it would make. And also she used um, redescending influence functions in order to take care of those interslice motion artifacts. The work didn't stop there. Uh, Bernard Kimes uh, in Nikai presented a flexible approach based on patch to volume registration, basically did uh, registration based on patches on images and reconstructed images with that quality here. We also published a paper a year later in article TMI, basically a fast implementation of um, the approach, robust reconstruction with the correct slice profile, all implemented on a GPU. So he basically reduced the time it took to about um, 10 minutes or so. Now, because of all of those developments, now we see even at 22 weeks, we see layers of the cortex because of the technology that uh, the community and we were able to develop. So, and uh, in the follow-up work, we um, uh, expanded that to the fission-weighted model. 
that started with the work that Benoit and uh, Benoit did, and uh, this was a work winning work at Nikai and was uh, published in Medical Image Analysis. Even though this was not on the fetus, but it was one of the earliest works on super resolution reconstruction using an inverse quantum solution for diffusion with the MRI. Um, and then in follow-up work, he basically developed uh, approach, uh, an approach called shortcut that uh, modeled that inverse problem and used uh, the tissue model uh, and a special regularizer in order to reconstruct super resolution diffusion with the model. Those are the details of the work. Now, along those lines, we were interested in developing motion robust diffusion with the model. So in expanding Benoit's work, we wanted to incorporate motion into that framework and do super resolution and motion correction at the same time, just like we did for structural T2 weighted imaging in a fetus. This is an example of how, um, well, this doesn't run, but uh, I wanted to show a, a diffusion weighted MRI. I have an example later I will show you. But what happens is that when you're acquiring diffusion weighted MRI, some slices are, are affected by fetal motion and are um, and present artifacts, but others do not. The differences between diffusion weighted MRI and T2 weighted MRI are few. Um, higher sampling rate. Here you have 10 hertz sampling, 100 milliseconds for every slice, or 10 slices per second, um, which is a advantage, advantage because you have higher temporal resolution in order to chase the fetus and track its motion. And the disadvantages that make it very challenging for us, especially for the fetus, is the varying contrast and the low resolution compared to uh, diffusion weighted MRI of newborns or adult patients. So if you get a fetal MRI off the scanner and process it, you get an image like that. So uh, we developed a motion robust diffusion weighted MRI reconstruction based on a slice level registration based motion tracking. And I will talk about the details of the, that approach. This was published uh, by Bahram Narami, a postdoc who published it in 2016. And estimated the slice level temporal head motion, and I will tell you what that is. Basically, we take advantage of the high sampling rate in slice acquisition, and we see, say that by, by doing Kalman filtering, adding Kalman filtering to slice to volume registration, we can basically improve our registration and motion tracking for, the, for, for subjects who move in subjects. These results on, uh, are on volunteer subjects who moved inside this scanner, so we have the ground truth. And you see that just by doing sequential registration, slice to volume registration, you get artifacts because, um, there is, as I said, registration does not have any guarantee and ultimately is solving an impulse problem. But a robust common filter motion tracking solution basically regularized it and led to much better results. Now, you see those peaks or noises there, those are outside of the brain. And there is, for this volunteer, there was no structure there, so registration could not uh, perform well, probably returned a wrong value, but that didn't make any impact on the results because we don't care about the area outside of the brain. The important thing is that that approach was able to quickly recover as soon as it saw part of the brain as part of the anatomy and solve the problem. Um, I will skip the details of how this was formulated, but basically the approach captures the dynamics of subject motion and we tested it on volunteer subjects and on retrospective data for newborn subjects. The advantage is that you can make the Kahneman filter, Kahneman filter by design is causal, so you can use it in prospective motion correction you can make it a common smoother too, which is non-causal and use it for uh, retrospective analysis of motion corrupted data. I will show you some images if I have time later on on newborn subjects. After slice motion correction, we will have variable length diffusion measurements. So it's no longer the case that we will have a set aside number of Q space measurements for every voxel on a regular lattice for uh, that subject. We will have a da complex data structure that has variable length diffusion measurements at different gradient directions. They are scattered in QS space and image space. And then we need to solve it. 
So similarly, we take uh, an inverse problem approach uh, uh, to inverse problem solution approach in order to tackle that problem. In order to fit a diffusion tensor model, that starts with this, this scale, a Tanner equation, which you see here, but the idea is to estimate tensors at every voxel based on the measurements for that voxel. And we formulated it this way, basically um, two weight terms, one of them uh, incorporates the slice profile and the distance of the measurements from the from any point that you want to reconstruct on your target uh, lattice for uh, diffusion tensor imaging. The results uh, published uh, by Bahram in papers uh, in 2016 and 19, this is an example of fetal uh, MRI. And uh, you see that if you get the original data, Oh, I'm sorry, this is, a, this is a volunteer data for which you had motion-free data. Standard is shown here. And if you get the original data, motion was too much that you get a, an image like that. If you do volume to volume registration, you get an image like that. If you just do motion tracking slice to volume registration and use our approach for robust reconstruction, you get an image that is very similar to the gold standard. And you can imagine how much of a motion existed there that and the approach was able to reconstruct. This is fetal DWI reconstruction. And we tried many different techniques for solving that inverse problem and uh, including nonlinear list squares and linear list squares uh, with different registration approaches. And ultimately the results show that our motion tracking starts to volume registration with robust karma filtering with weighted linear list square solution performed the best. And this was published in Neuro Energy 2017. This was the image that I was referring to to tell you that some of that video that didn't work, I wanted to show that some of some of the slices have relatively good quality. Overall, you have seen DWIs uh, of newborns and volunteers and adults. These are very noisy. Fetal DWI is very difficult. On top of that, many of the slices are affected by motion this way. Um, so what Bahram did, he developed a support vector machine, uh, which in a supervised manner learned to detect and uh, remove or filter those motion corrupted slices from the analysis. That was similar to T2-weighted MRI reconstruction, the way we developed those motion robust reconstruction techniques. This was crucial to give us good results on fetal DWI and also in volunteers and newborns. We quantitatively assessed it the way we did it in fetuses. Always evaluation is challenging, but we said that we expect to see high FA in the corpus callosum region, for example, or in the limbs of the internal capsule, where we know that we have uh, rich fibers. And if the idea is that if motion is not compensated and if there is a lot of motion, then because the neighboring structures such as ventricles and will map to that area across the, the span of the diffusion acquisitions, those will reduce the FA. But if we compensate for motion correctly, then the FA should be high in corpus callosum region. And so we, we analyzed the data that we have for fetuses that, that we had, and we measured FA uh, in the corpus callosum and plotted it across age or age at which the fetuses were scanned. And this showed that if you didn't do any processing, first of all, FA values were very low. And then also the FA decreased in corpus callosum region which, with age. However, when we applied our technique, motion tracking SVR, not only the values of the FA were very high, but also it showed the trend that we expected that the FA goes up as uh, the fetus and brain matures. Same observations, stronger in limbs of the internal capsule. And you see how much we gained by using that approach. Uh, we said that the approach is robust to motion. How can we assess that? Again, we looked at the FA in corpus callosum and limbs of the internal capsule. And the idea, and we, based on the estimated motion parameters for slices, we calculate an average absolute motion score, 
which goes in millimeters from, let's say, two millimeters to eight millimeters, sort of the fetus is based on that. So basically this plot, this fetus had a lot of motion compared to those fetuses had little, uh, not much motion. And we saw how different techniques worked. Again, the trend is that the original and volume volunteer registration generated very low FA values, but our approach generated the highest FA value. Not only that, it didn't decrease, it didn't degrade by the amount of motion that we saw. Same thing in the limbs of the internal capsule. Then we looked at the average speed of motion. We calculated the derivatives of the motion because we did have motion tracking with the approach that we had. So we could calculate the speed of motion, uh, millimeter per repetition time uh, shown here. And for the corpus callosum region, we see that well, all the techniques, again, our technique performed the best, but all the techniques showed a, a downward trend, showing that performance drops. Of course, if you have a lot of fast motion, then, then there is a limitation on what you can do. But still, even for this fetus, we're getting an FA, which is more than 0.3 compared to the volume to volume registration. We would have given us a, an FA of 0 0.05, completely unexpected for the corpus callosum region. So that approach helped us to do whole brain tractography, and I will get back to this later on. This is basically, we were, first time Baham created this figure, we were uh, amazed by how much you could see in a 26 week fetus by DTI, by just fitting a DTI model. The next part of my uh, techniques is about the resources. So those were the tools that we developed and tried, helped to develop. And now I want to talk about some of the resources that were uh, built around those tools or built because we did have access to those tools. Atlas is one of those. If we didn't have these motion robust volume reconstructions, we could not have built the atlases that we have for fetuses now. This shows an snapshot of our current fetal, fMRI, fetal MRI processing pipeline. So the top part is a structural, T2 structural uh, imaging pipeline uh, from the T2 weighted slices. We did an initial volume, then reconstructed uh, super resolution image, brain mask it, correct for bias, um, register it to an atlas, now it is registered in the correct angle. Fetuses can be in any orientation in the world coordinate system. And then multi-atlas segmentation is the approach that we use to find the atlas labels on the image. And that gives us parcel weighted uh, images. For the diffusion processing pipeline, similar strategy gives us an image, tractography. We could merge these two and do connectivity analysis. These pipelines include reconstruction, registration, segmentation, tractography, things like that. This is the special temporal fetal brain MRI atlas that we developed um, from 80 fetuses, scanned at different ages. Um, they are all healthy fetuses, and the atlas represents normative growth of the fetal brain for the population. It's an unbiased atlas because we used a, an unbiased diffomorphic diffomorphic registration in different groups. Uh, with kernel regression in age. Uh, was published in scientific reports in 2017 and also I presented it in the CHI 2014. We basically over the years with the help of our scientific and clinical collaborators uh, whose help was instrumental, we uh, segmented the brain. Um, now we have parcellations and tissue segmentations. The atlas is publicly available uh, for the research community and this shows the atlas parcellations. We also built a special temporal fetal DTI atlas. The idea is that any technology that we develop um, help us to move to the next stage. So basically we built diffusion tensor images of fetuses that helped us to build this. And Shadab was my second postdoc who worked on it and published it in NeuroImage, a very comprehensive paper which showed we can really achieve nice images like that, which represent uh, how the fetal brain microstructure develops before birth. The way he did it was, again, through unbiased, group wise deformorphic form of registration. What we observed, uh, one of the main observations was that a tensor to tensor registration framework uh, helped us to do much better regression of images on a, on a manifold 
uh, and basically create that average unbiased average that has based on six objects shown here. We identified fetal brain structure. Shut up. Uh, was an electrical engineer, but worked rigorously on identifying uh, fetal brain structures. Uh, of course, Lana's help was uh, uh, very helpful, and she also spent a lot of time with us to, to identify and advise us on what they were. And it made a very good paper. Lana contributed to the paper writing and to many parts of the interpretation of these results, too. So um, I talked about the, our pipeline. It has several processing uh, parts that I showed you. The, one of the questions that we had was that can we automatize the pipeline as much as possible? And we had two goals. One was to improve acquisition. So we were after fast algorithms that automatically segment and also register images and also improve the processing because at the end of the day, some of our, uh, some of the parts of our pipeline, such as brain masking or registration, needed manual work or manual uh, quality control. Could we do it automatically and faster? So we spent some time on those. And Sadiq was a research assistant in my group who developed a unit style deep neural network in 2017 uh, to that segmented the fetal brain very accurately in a supervised manner. And you see sample images here. If it does work, okay. So you see, despite the a lot of fetal motion, it captures the brain all the time. And this is super fast algorithm because it has a training phase and at test time, it is very quick. This fit is moved abruptly and completely following the fetal brain in those images. We tested abnormal cases, found the brain, even though it didn't see anything like this in the training set which was very amazing, even to us, who developed the algorithm. Um, a case with a lot of motion, our, this is the ground truth. So uh, our research assistant um, made those masks. And he decided to skip this one, correct, because I, we, we decided to skip those because those are not useful for reconstruction. We want to remove them. But the algorithm found part of the brain in that one too. Ultimately, if you look at that, the entire scan in all of plain view, you see that there is a very good match between what the algorithm found and the ground truth found. And we found, we compared to some uh, alternative approaches too. In terms of the similarity metrics uh, with the ground truth, dice similarity, very high, good sensitivity, specificity, and processing time at test time, less than a second. So basically we called it the real time automatic fetal brain extraction technique by deep learning. It's faster than the single fast system echo repetition time. And Sadiq continued his work. He said that he wanted to also solve the other issue, which is registration of these images. He knew that fetal images after reconstruction or even during acquisition can be in any orientation. He wanted to register them to our atlas space. So basically designed a regression network, uh, one of a kind network that learned through samples to find the pose of the fetus in 3D and register images automatically to the atlas coordinates. These are the results. So we are comparing to volume to volume registration with center of gravity matching with principal axis alignment. Um, and he did have two networks, correction net and pose net uh, with different loss functions. And basically the results show that we got, we improved over volume to volume registration a lot Basically, the x-axis here shows the initial rotation that uh, was needed to bring the fetus to that as coordinates. That means these fetuses here were, uh, had a large rotation with respect to the atlas, whereas these fetuses here were close in their uh, 3D angle with respect to the atlas. So for these, one to volume registration with gravity center matching worked very well. But as soon as the fetuses had deviated from those, VBR completely failed. VBR with principal axis alignment worked to some extent, but again, did not uh, work very well uh, for many cases. 
that uh, our deep learning solution basically found the position very well. We did the same for slices. So basically show that you can estimate the fetal head pose, even from a slices, one slice. And that gave us a, an average accuracy of 10 degrees, which was also non-trivial, but very interesting. This is a, a snapshot of what it can happen. So this is the original image, very weird position with respect to the atlas, if you will. And this is the age matched atlas from our spatial temporal atlas, the last column. First column is the input image. And with the pose net, you get that one. With VVRD, which is a combination of volume to volume registration and pose net, you get 7.2 degrees. With Sadio's correction net, we got 5.2 degrees error, which was much better than even VVR did, which was a combination of volume to volume registration and his pose net. Then with volume to volume registration with center of gravity matching, it found the principal axis relatively well, but missed to register them. That work, we continued with another research assistant after Sadek left. Uh, I worked with another research assistant, Ayush, who, who developed a recurrent neural network based on uh, long, short, and memory modules. So basically, they were convolutional neural network modules that extracted the features and then LSTMs that used those features in order to predict uh, the position of the fetus based on the time series. So basically, what this model does looks at the frames. The idea was that fetal slices are acquired after one another, and there is that temporal dependency between them should be incorporated ideally in what we had for, for pose estimation and could help us to get much better pose estimation and motion tracking. So basically we did that and we saw that we could get much lower errors uh, even predicted for different time steps into the future on images that we could. We also worked on segmentation. So I showed some of the brain extraction methods earlier. Um, so far until uh, a couple of years ago or last year, we were using a multi atlas segmentation techniques for fetal brain extract, for fetal brain tissue segmentation and parcellation. Now we have tried deep convolutional neural networks in particular. This work we see, which is currently under review after revision, uh, presents a deep attentive convolutional neural network for cortical plate segmentation. And you see that uh, our te the ground truth is here on this fetus, on two fetuses, uh, older and younger. Our approach is here, and a bunch of other techniques that one could use, including the uh, vanilla unit here. And you see that our approach performs much better than others. I will skip the details of the approach, but basically our approach, our technique now um, gives segmentations that are much more topologically correct than other competitive approaches in terms of the similarity metrics. It performs also better. We compared it against multi atlas segmentation. Um, three experts evaluated the images, and very interestingly, two experts always picked the deep learning approach over the multi atlas segmentation for cortical plate segmentation. Uh, so we, our conclusion was that it, at least for cortical plate segmentation, it performs much better than all other techniques. With that, about the techniques, uh, I think I have about five or 10 minutes to talk about the applications. I will try to be very quick in that. Um, so basically, this is the work that our collaborators did. I give all the credit to our collaborators, commissions, and I will mention those uh, papers here. It started in 2012, roughly. A year after we published our paper, we started working with Catherine and Propolis and Cedric Kurushow, uh, Catherine's postdoc, on reconstructing images that many of which were acquired at Boston Children's actually. And this paper published in 2012 in Brain Structure Function showed how the cycle depth changed between 25 weeks and 35 weeks of gestation for normal fetuses. And uh, note that this was not possible without having that robust super resolution reconstruction because you could not just get a 3D uh, coherent model of the cortical plate the way we've been showing in our slides here. Uh, it's not possible without having images reconstructed in 3D first. 
So everything is dependent on each other here. Now, we also did on our cohorts volumetric analysis, basically normative volumetric curves of how cortical plate volume changes, basically still in the exponential phase of the growth from 20 weeks to 40 weeks. And it may later on go to that uh, two phase after birth. Uh, I fitted different models, but basically Gompert's model based uh, model those um, cortical, plate, uh, cortical plate volumes, cerebral, cerebellar volume, and brainstem model. Other structures show different patterns. Total brain volume looks like already by the by turn, it's um, the rate is decreasing. So a Gompert's model measures it very well, and the developing bottleneck. Then I would like to present some of Dr. Basing's works uh, published in several cortex. She looked at transient fetal compartments, basically um, manually or semi-automatically segmented those structures. She did incredible work in looking at cortical plate and subplate in 22 regions, in 42 healthy fetuses in that age range. And these are the regions that she found and analyzed found significant regional six, sex differences between males and females in the inferior frontal gyrus, in the frontal lobe, uh, also in the lim limbic lobe and occipital lobe. Um, she also found regional hemispheric asymmetry uh, in the inferior frontal gyrus and right word asymmetry in the or orbital frontal cortex. Uh, following up in another paper in several cortex in 2020, shows the growth patterns of the cortical plate and the subplate basically um, will disappear at the later decision age after 31 weeks. She also characterized regional relative volume increases. And um, you see how the different volume, different regions relative to each other uh, changed across gestation. Now, a little bit about the impact of our uh, diffusion rate the MRI. Uh, we were able to do whole brain tractography. I showed the figure earlier, but I promised to go back to it. And this shows how much you gain you will get by using our motion tracking slash to volume registration compared to the original or even volume to volume registration. And the impact of that would be on group average fetal connectome. This shows the edge space similarity. It shows that you get much better similarity between subjects with our approach compared to just using the original data or VDR. The, the bar here shows the space similarity in the vertical bar. The horizontal bar underneath, which is in gray state, shows the amount of average motion grade for every fetus in a cohort. And these are 21 fetuses, so basically 21 by 21 by matrix. And those that have darker parts had a lot of motion. And you see that um, there was a little bit of correlation between the blue areas that show uh, degraded just space similarity between fetuses and those birds. Based on that, what you could do group average fetal structural connective analysis that we um, um, preliminary uh, discussed in new image paper that we published. Now I wanted to, regarding the fetal tract that we wanted to uh, cite Dr. Uh, Camilo James, incredible work published in human brain mapping this year, earlier this year, and this shows uh, seed based track wrapping fetuses at 29 weeks, 32 weeks, 36 weeks. Uh, as I said, it's amazing how much of the details you can see those fetuses. In terms of abnormal development, uh, we started again with the congenital heart disease cohort back in 2012 when we worked with uh, the group uh, who had moved to uh, Children's National Medical Center at that time. But basically, in that paper in several cortex, they showed delayed cortical development in fetuses with congenital heart disease compared to controls. Now, Dr. Rollins has recruited a lot of CHD babies at children's, scanned them two times prenatally and uh, compared them to healthy controls. And these are the data from her very recent papers um, just appeared in Annals of Neurology, uh, which showed the differences uh, between the total brain volume and ventricular zone between the babies with CHD and controls. She also looked at the subplate zone, intermediate zone, and other brain structures. I would also mention Dr. Sindor Tinal's works published in neuroimage and cerebral cortex, all using fetal data, looking at graph trajectories and cycle patterns, 
and also Dr. James' um, new AJNR paper, uh, an analysis of the again congenital heart disease cohort for the fetal brain maturation score. Basically, the results show that there is a delay uh, in the fetal total maturation score between the two groups, and also a delay in the average general cell matrix subscores between the two groups. Um, in another work related to CHD, we did track the specific group analysis based on our in utero diffusion tensor imaging and Shadov conducted that work with, with uh, our collaborators. This was published in Nikai and this is a pattern that Shadov used for group wise uh, analysis. And I, I think I stopped there with the approaches that I wanted to talk about. Um, I also wanted to mention that the groups in London um, I've been in contact with, with the groups that are developing, uh, further developing these ideas. So basically this shows that similar to what they've done, moving to localization segmentation over the past years, trying to automatize everything. Uh, in other centers, people are also uh, doing the similar work. And this is an example of the work done by Michael Lipner under uh, supervision of Tom and this basically is an implementation of a wall super-resolution volume reconstruction um, that gives you an opportunity to use different loss function and regularizers. A good thing about this technique was that uh, Michael talked to me and, and tried to uh, incorporate our atlas into the reconstruction. So basically you can get the direct reconstruction in the atlas space with that tool, in our atlas space with that tool. And I also wanted to mention uh, Maria's recent work uh, Alena Ulfs published a paper in TMI this year on deformable starch to water registration, which is, as you can imagine, is much more difficult than rigid deformable registration. My conclusion is very short. Basically, the motion robust super resolution for MRI has been instrumental and it enabled everything that I discussed here motion robust DWI, fMRI, tractography, automatic segmentation, longitudinal and group analysis, and helped us to build the atlases that provide us with normative data. I would like to acknowledge my contributors and contributing series. Of course, I didn't have time to list everybody. I tried hard. Obviously, these are the contributors and my collaborators on fetal imaging and fetal MRI only. I'm not um, listing my collaborators on other projects. And again, there is a very good high chance that I have missed somebody here, but I tried to, I tried my best. Um, and at the end, I wanted to acknowledge the grants from NIH and foundations who helped us to conduct this work. That concludes my talk and then I think I've left some time for questions. I would be happy to take questions. Absolutely beautiful work, Ali. It's so wonderful to see it as kind of a complete whole. It's a, a, just a substantial Sorry. contribution to the field. It's just wonderful to hear all that. Um, question for you on the um, Diffusion imaging, do you, I'm, I'm curious about one thing. It, we, we used to think that motion drove up FA versus down FA. I'm curious why in the fetus, motion decreases FA instead of increases FA. Do you have any the, thoughts around that? The average could be, but we, that, the part that I was talking about is regional and we focused on very small blob that we put, blob of one by one by one radius box so that they put in corpus callosum region and limbs of the internal capsule. In that area, we expected to have high FA. Mm -hmm. On average, I agree with you that the more that FA may go up, depending on the type of motion. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if the motion is so much that, and we don't filter for those completely blacked out slices that signal is completely lost, um, I think you would not get high FA, but depending on the type of motion and the amount of motion and how it affects the diffusion sensitization, depend, that also depends on the sequence that you run, you could get that. And one other question I'll let everybody else um, do. Uh, what are your thoughts on spatial resolution targets for, particularly I'm thinking of the tractography and the corpus callosum is like almost subvoxel and the cortex is, is very small, and especially when you get down to the younger fetuses. So what are your thoughts on where we are right now for spatial resolution and 
um, tractography versus where you would like to get in terms of an optimal um, to, to be able to do those tracks more robustly across gestational ages? In my opinion, far away. Uh, of course, the plate is very thin. Everything is very small here, especially younger fetus and so I, I just confirm what you said. I think we're far away, but, but we've seen improvements over the years. I mean, when I started in 2004, 1.5T, and with Judy, when we were running a scan, we were even becoming happy if we were able to get a four millimeter slice thickness on fetus. Mm -hmm. Now on 3T, and with owner, once we tried 1.2 millimeter slice thickness and the image was good. Well, that was one incidence, but I think, um, I mean, the combination of hardware and software ultimately will help us. How much it will help, I cannot predict, but what I can say by sure that um, um, any, any resolution that we get, uh, gain, uh, it will be useful because the structures are so small here. So we'll not stop on, on seeking for high resolution. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. So I have some question about division MRI processing. First, thanks for giving a great talk and sharing the details of your studies. Uh, just my question is the in diffusion, fetal diffusion MRI processing criteria, approximately how's the success rate of uh, fetal diffusion MRI processing? And also uh, what do you think about the reliability of fetal brain fiber tracking and even connectome analysis? What do you think about that analysis sure. reliability? Sure, very good questions. Two questions that you asked, I answered the first mm -hmm. um, first. And that depends, the, the success rate depends on how you conduct the imaging. I would yeah. say that if, if your goal, let's say there is a clinical case that you are forced to get good diffusion rate image, then I will get the radiologist permission and the department chair permission and get and do 30 minutes of diffusion rated imaging on that fetus. And I can say 100, well, not 100%, 90% sure, I will get a tractography that shows the major tracts. Mm -hmm. But I never did that 30 minute diffusion rated imaging. Uh, I always try to limit it to less than 10 minutes or even seven minutes. So for that reason, depending how the fetus moves and how the distortions bother us, we can get different ranges of uh, um, reconstruction quality. Same, this is not limited to uh, diffusion. This is for T2 as well. And if, if you're running a research study and our aim is to reconstruct in 3D, we know how much we should do for T2s in order to reconstruct something. So our success rate in that study, given that we are at least visually getting feedback and acquiring images, would be more than 80%. I can say by sure it would be more than 80% for any age range. But if it is retrospective analysis of data and goes back and uh, technology or whoever did it was not focused on the brain. For example, the indication was the body and they acquired few examples of brain only which were disrupted by motion, then success rate might be much lower. So in fact, when, whenever we do retrospective analysis on um, different cases that were not focused on neuro, our success rate may be as low as 40%, that much. But, but as I said, the, the good thing is that uh, we can adapt it the way we, we like. So, and I encourage, so maybe part of what we advocate as part of our papers is to tell people, okay, if you want this, either for clinical or scientific purposes, make sure that the original imaging is good enough. The second question about the reliability of tractography and connectome analysis. So everything is relative. Um, I think um, we, we will try our best something is definitely better than nothing. And we've shown that techniques are working. This is, I would say that this is similar to any other field. I've seen that people published on fetal fMRI, which is actually much more difficult than diffusion weighted MRI, I would say I've worked on it myself too. And, but I, and I, um, but I think um, um, if, if we agree that um, this thing is very difficult, then we acknowledge that there might be errors similar to the fMRI field itself. And the older um, studies had a lot of 
errors in them and a lot of inaccuracies, but over the time, we're getting more and more accurate results. So I think on FITOC, we should somehow lower expectations a little bit and then also um, improve it that way. That being said, I guess my answer to your question is that it's not as reliable as I would expect, I would like. Definitely not as reliable as I would, I would like, but, but I would say that it, it's showing a lot of uh, scientific um, findings too, as our collaborators have shown in papers, and you yourself have worked on it, so. Okay. And I have one more question. You showed uh, fetal atlas-based uh, regional segmentation. So is, is it based on linear or nonlinear registration? Nonlinear registration, the form of registration. Nonlinear, okay. Yes. Okay, great. Does um does anyone have any other questions? Um, I have one quick question, um, Ali. Great talk. It's Rudolf. Um, is this uh, what is your lab's take or these these processes that you've shown in um, is your software on GitHub? Is it open source? Can other folks jump in and deploy them? What's the story with that? Many of them are open source. Um, many of them are on, on, on GitHub. So. Um, and some of them, we, I mean, our atlases are available, uh, or for example, fetal extraction tools. And we, we tried to make many of those, especially the latest ones, the learning ones, available open source so that other people can use it. Our diffusion processing pipeline is very complicated. I, I, at the moment, we are doing on a um, tried basis. Basically, we get samples from different centers process them, and then uh, as soon as we make sure that they can run our processing pipeline, uh, we can give it to them to run in, in their own centers. So basically, as you can imagine, this is not, uh, still, uh, while we have done all of these improvements to automatize the whole thing, but uh, um, I don't think there's such a thing exists uh, at the moment for diffusion processing, but um, it, it takes time to make sure that anybody outside of our group can run this whole thing uh, robustly based on our uh, code, um, but we can do it. It basically that slice to volume registration, for example, takes the slice timing from DICOMs. I'm, I'm giving some examples of what the complications are. So depending on is, what scanner you're using, what type of sequence you're using, that slice timing could be different and that could affect the very first stage of how you apply your algorithm. Um. Yeah, don't worry, I, I'm fully intimately aware with how complex these things can be. So now I'm just wondering, you know, what stage. But for, for some parts of it that are probably easier, for example, Brain extraction, we, it's, it's publicly available. This, you can find the links, you know, most of our papers have links in them, GitHub pages. We have the BCH Imagine GitHub page. Uh, I've encouraged my people to put their codes there and even the training models. If you are interested in a specific one, send us an email and then we will work with you to release it. Sounds good. Sure, thank you. Is your motion correction tool also publicly available? For, as I said, well, it, we can, I would prefer to test it on subjects. Mm -hmm. And then once we make sure that it works mm -hmm. for um, the sequences that people are acquiring, then I would be happy to, to tell them how to run it. Um, it's not, for that reason, we didn't make it publicly available because I think there's no point to it. We basically, we expect that if I make it publicly available that part, then I'll get hundreds of questions. Uh, and so for that reason, I prefer to do it on a, let's say one-to-one -one sort of um, um, interactive session to tell people how to run it, even if we move to that stage that they want to run it themselves. Um, well, solutions could be to make it 
yeah, I, I think that's a, it, it definitely in our plan to make these available. But as I said, um, at the level of DICOM conversion, slice timing, um, tag extraction, all of those things require some uh, adjustments depending on the scanners that you're using. But Sorry. Yeah, sure. I have just a small comment like regarding I'm not a technical person um, but I know how to use some of the tools and I, I do have just a small comment because I'm using the tools um, tools like I'm relying on process you guys processing a lot of data for me and like you have different versions of pipelines as, as I understood so like putting publicly for example for my work, sometimes I choose one version over other because it shows sublight better. Um, so it's kind of like a lot of versions can be tailored to a specific question. Um, so I'm not like, I, I would, don't want to go into like putting everything publicly, but it's, you have a lot of versions and a lot of advancement that could be specifically tailored to question. So it's kind of just my comment. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Golifar. We really appreciate you coming. Uh, it looks like we've gone over our allotted time. Um, so thank you to all. And uh, this Zoom uh, presentation is also being recorded. So for those who weren't able to attend or would like to watch later, it will be on the FNN DSB website. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.